Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Exploring Student Engagement and Affordability for Student Success. My name is Rhonda Seelinger and I am the Customer Engagement Manager for Macmillan Learning Institutional Solutions and I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate your time and your interest. We are going to get started here in just a moment. I do have a couple of quick announcements first. Um, you probably just heard we are in listen-only mode, and we do this just to help keep out background noise because there are a lot of people on the line. Um, that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you because we definitely do, and how we communicate is using either the chat area or the question area. And um, you're welcome to enter a comment or a question at any point during the presentation, and I will be monitoring those throughout, and we promise to do our best to address any questions or comments. Also, we are recording today's webinar, and we will send a link to you shortly afterwards, and you'll, you're free to share that with anyone that you think might be interested. And with those things covered, I am really pleased to introduce our guest speaker today, Leif Nelson, who is the Director of Learning Technology Solutions at Boise State University. Leif, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited to talk about these topics. Uh, and I just want to say, too, before I begin, that uh, I really, really appreciate uh, Macmillan um, for this opportunity. And uh, Rhonda and everybody that I've worked with is, is really great. Um, that's a completely unsolicited but but sincere comment. I, I really enjoy working with these folks. So I'm going to start with with maybe kind of a weird question. Why do we care about students? And if you can put something in the chat if you want, but it's it's a rhetorical question. But really, I wonder why do we care so much about students? Why do we care that they're engaged and retained, and successful, on track, high performing? Low risk, intrusively advised, nudged, coached, empowered, mentored, gritty, confident, and financially secure. This is a relatively new phenomenon, right? It, it used to be that being a poor, starving college student was like uh, some sort of a rite of passage. And it wasn't the professor's job to care if students failed or skipped or dropped. Uh, and advisors didn't really exist that much, let alone things like student success coaches. So is all this attention to student behavior part of this new age of parenting that started with the baby boomers when we've been coddling a generation, uh, really a couple generations by now, of entitled infantilized kids where everybody's special and gets like a participation trophy just for showing up? Maybe, but I think there's more to the story here. So first, we need to have a more nuanced conception of who our college students really are. They're not these traditional age, high performing, middle class, whatever kind of picture comes to mind when you think of the term uh, college student. Um, and you all know this, right? You work in higher education or, or, or education. Students today are diverse in every sense of the word. The majority of them are what is called uh, Pell eligible. Um, and you know that that is that's kind of a euphemism for having financial need or uh, basically poor, right? In many cases, um, or under the poverty level. Over half of them work at least part time. Many of them work full time. Many of them have children. Uh, meanwhile, the rising cost of tuition, increased competition, declining uh, high school graduation rates in many parts of the country, um, and initiatives to increase the number of of citizens with degrees and certificates like Complete College America, things like that. We have our own at, at an Idaho level, um, Complete College Idaho, Idaho, it's called, very creative. Um, these things put pressures on institutions to be more uh, quote unquote efficient and effective, right? So there's multiple things at play here. We care about students because, I mean, we have empathy for them as individuals. We want them to succeed. But we also care about our, um, the health of our nation, our society, right? We want our communities, states, and regions to be, to have well-informed citizens who participate in, um, in their communities. And of course, we want our institutions to be successful so that they can keep offering educational opportunities um, in the future to people from all walks of life. So there are different uh, dimensions, promoting individual success, promoting the interests of the institutions that we work at, um, but also thinking maybe about broader, broader community, community and societal benefits and, and impacts of, uh, of, of higher education and education in general. 
Now at a local institutional level, I would say that this increasing focus on student success is not always, it's not always clear what units and departments are responsible for addressing those challenges. We could look at groups like enrollment services, for example, uh, but in today's environments, when we talk about student success, retention, engagement, affordability, it covers the gamut. It involves IT, it involves your, your teaching and learning or faculty development units, it involves student affairs, maybe housing, maybe financial aid, probably institutional research, uh, the whole spectrum of, of units that are often under different um, divisions at your campus. So what we see now are more forms of uh, collaboration across different campus units. And it's a blessing and a, and a curse, right? Um, because it can create confusion around who's in charge, how are programs being evaluated, uh, what is, how is success even being defined in the first place, who's responsible for kind of keeping the timeline and the cadence of work, um, who's holding people accountable, things like that. So that pros and cons, collaboration, Excuse me, collaboration obviously is a good thing, um, but when it could lead to a lack of clarity or a lack of um, who's the single person in charge, um, there could be some problems associated with that. So we see the emergence of things like uh, new committees, right? We see new special task forces maybe, or strategic plans and initiatives. Uh, sometimes we, we see new roles even at all, all levels of the institution. I was in a discussion just recently about a new executive role focused on, uh, I don't even remember, it was like student success and campus effectiveness or something like that. Um, and certainly new products and services like uh, things like Macmillan Sky Factor line of tools, um, uh, customer relationship managers, or maybe what a recent article, I guess somewhat recent about a year ago, in Inside Higher Ed uh, called, because we don't have enough acronyms, right? We need new acronyms. They called it a Student Success Management System, or SSMS. So are these things the domain of IT, student affairs, academics, administrative units, or all of the above? Another important voice, especially here at Boise State, in these conversations about student success has, in fact, been that of students. And I'll provide just a few examples of some student-led initiatives or things that grew out of student concerns. Uh, I'll talk about some of the governance structures that we have in place and processes that we've created to try to address some of the confusion around the roles and responsibilities. Uh, and I'll talk about some ways that we've tried to address affordability, especially uh, in some of our institutional software tools. But ultimately, the more I talk to folks at my own campus, the more I realize that there are lots and lots of projects going on to try to try to tackle these challenges. So first, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, and where I work. Uh, as Rhonda said, I'm the Director of Learning Technology Solutions. That's part of our information, uh, our Office of Information Technology here at Boise State. My department didn't exist five years ago. I had to build it from scratch. And I think building a department at a university is maybe like uh, building like a log cabin by yourself with, with hand tools. Uh, and in fact, a um, little bit about my upbringing, that's, that's exactly what my parents did nearly 40 years ago. Um, they built a log cabin from scratch with hand tools. I grew up in a rural area. We didn't have much in the way of technology, um, partly by choice, but partly out of um, financial necess necessity. When I went to college, I was one of those quote unquote Pell eligible students. Uh, I lived off campus. I worked at least two jobs at any given time while attending school. I wasn't first generation per se, but there were uh, plenty of people in my family who were GED uh, recipients. And I uh, would leave, semest leave campus for a semester at a time uh, to save money uh, throughout my undergraduate years. And I would enroll at the very last second when I came back. So 20 years later, I'm on all these committees and groups and I'm looking at risk indicators and I had this epiphany not too long ago, like, oh my God, I was an at-risk student and I had no idea at the time. So I met my wife while I was in college um, and she likes to remind me that I went from uh, an academically struggling student to a straight A student right about the time that, that I met her. Um, I'm not sure how scalable of an inter intervention strategy that is for other people, but it worked for me apparently. Uh, after college, I got an IT job at the university where I, where I got my bachelor's degree. Uh, and from there, some doors opened up and I got a better job at a bigger university, went on to get my master's degree, 
uh, and then moved to Boise, where I started uh, both the doctoral program here and was kind of handed this task of building a new department from scratch. Boise State itself is like the little community college that could. And in fact, up until the 1970s, it was literally just that. It was a community college that became a four-year uh, bachelor's degree granting university. Then it started offering master's degrees, then doctorates. And just recently, like literally a couple years ago, we finally became a doctoral granting research university. And we're really proud of that. Um, we have great partnerships with our local communities and businesses like uh, Micron, Simplot. Um, uh, we, we've established a degree completion program with the local uh, credit union I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but we have also formalized some partnerships with fairly prestigious groups like Harvard Business School, um, Stanford's D School, and the IDO design firm. Um, mostly, uh, these partnerships are through our, our newest college. It's called the College of Innovation and Design. And, and in fact, uh, some of our connections with IDO has led to some of the student success projects that, that we worked on. Um, one of these projects where students were, uh, they put together a, a team as part of a design thinking project, and they wanted to focus on commuter students. They knew that there was a high population in, in the Treasure Valley region, which is what we call the, the Boise and surrounding met metropolitan area. There were a lot of students that came to Boise State who were maybe first generation. They lived at home with their parents just down the road. Um, and going to college was this fairly transactional thing. And this student group of design thinkers were pretty savvy and they said, how can we make these commuter students feel more connected? And they came up with a list of ideas um, that they arrived at through doing some design ethnography uh, research studies with these students, and they pitched it to our VPs. They went to our executive council and they said, look, we've been doing this research project, um, we've got some insights and we wanna to present to you uh, some, some ideas. Now, they didn't necessarily approve all those things, but what it did is it formalized this new wave of efforts to focus on student success and retention, specifically targeting these um, populations of students. So one of the things that came out of this is we created a committee called the Student Success and Retention Committee. And what we've done in this committee is we've identified, like I said, um, the population of student with, I mean, we've really refined our, our model for identifying the students that have the lowest persistent rates from their freshman to sophomore years. In our case, it's first time Pell eligible living off campus, the commuter students people whose families live in the Treasure Valley, they probably have for several generations in many cases. These are our neighbors, right? These, these are the people that we wanna succeed for the health of our city. Um, so it's more than just making our numbers look good or getting tuition money, um, but we want our local first time Pell eligible off-campus students to be successful because we, because we care about them, right? Uh, and community engagement, I should add, is another one of those uh, Carnegie, Carnegie designations that, that Boise State holds. So in this committee, we did a few things. Um, we put together kind of a brain trust of folks that you can see listed here, representing a broad swath of campus uh, constituents, student affairs, center for teaching and learning, faculty advising, and then me, the token IT person there. Um, we hosted an event, it was called Ideation. This was another design thinking kind of thing. And we brought together dozens of people from all across campus. Uh, and, and I should add, it wasn't just students and faculty, or sorry, staff and faculty. We also had a lot of students there. And the students had kind of a dual role. Uh, in many cases, they were providing um, testimonials for us that we would use as case studies to develop our user profiles and go through some design activities to come up with potential solutions. Uh, but they also participated in the, in the brainstorming and design efforts that we did. So in parallel, this, this event, we came up with lots of good ideas. Um, that informed the Student Success and Retention Committee, which ultimately came up with four projects that we were gonna pursue over the next, next year or longer in some cases. And these projects included things like communication, outreach strategies, promoting a sense of mattering and belonging among the target group of students, but all students really, and looking at some of our practices for, for low-hanging fruit. Uh, we, originally, the, the title of that project proposal was um, Get Rid of Stupid Practices, but we uh, made it sound a little bit nicer and uh, said, look at 
inefficiencies or something. Uh, anyway, but we want to focus on um, removing holds, things like that. And we want to focus on these eligible but not enrolled students, especially over the summertime. You know, you had your window to re-enroll in classes this fall. Why haven't you done that yet? Anything we can do to help? Do you have some financial difficulties? And then do some outreach campaigns with uh, those, those students. So the project I proposed as part of this group, uh, along with our director for the Center for Teaching and Learning, looks at uh, LMS-based uh, data and uh, interventions that we can look at from that. Um, so why did I suggest LMS data integrations? Well, first of all, I was involved in a pilot project last year with my colleague Rob Nyland from our eCampus Center, and he already found some positive results in working with our new uh, learning analytics product that, that we helped install. Uh, Rob here worked with instructors and advisors from our multidisciplinary studies major, and they found they, they did a semester to semester comparison and saw that retention went up by 8% in that program. And this is a program that where their retention rates were already really high. They went from like high 80s to mid 90s. So really impressive. There's something going on there. Uh, one thing that Rob is really uh, careful to point out, though, is that it wasn't just the, the fact that they had analytics tools um, and the data helped, but, but that wasn't the significant variable variable. You don't just turn on some software and then retention goes up. Um, it was the project itself and how it, enc it encouraged people to be more intentional about looking at data and talking about it, interpreting it together, and then thinking about ways to reach out to students. Uh, and they, they did just that. I mean, they would actually push the reports out to advisors embedded in the program, uh, faculty members on a weekly basis. And then also on a weekly basis, they would get together all of the the members of this pilot project and have a discussion about what they wanted to do. Um, one of the more, I guess, kind of heartbreaking examples from this pilot was a student who was struggling in a course. It, it triggered the red flag. It said, hey, so-and-so, you might want to do an intervention. So they reached out, see if anything's going on with this, this person who was doing fine up until this, this certain point where it's just significant dip, like what's going on, right? Uh, and they found out that the student was in this kind of financial dire straits, um, having trouble making ends meet and even uh, affording food. So what these folks did in our multidisciplinaries program is they introduced the student to uh, the Dean of Students office where they actually have a program to provide food stipends for students in need. And the student didn't know about it. So they made that connection got the students some financial help, and they ended up doing really well in the course um, at the end of the day. So, so like I say, this is, this is kind of heartbreaking uh, and, and nice that, that we were able to identify this student and give them the help that they need. Um, so it points to the effectiveness of some of these data-based intervention strategies, but also that there might be some bigger systemic things going on with our college students that, that we should also think about addressing uh, in, in whatever ways we can. Okay, so let's segue a little bit. Um, affordability, as I kind of touched on, is a big issue for college students today. If you saw in the earlier chart, it said that around half of all of our uh, college students are, are of this Pell eligible status. So any ways that we can find to cut costs for them, I think is can have a huge impact, especially if you're doing it at scale. Open educational resources, in my opinion, is one of these uh, concepts that I think we're seeing more and more campuses just get behind and promote and talk about as a, as an option to look at affordable instructional content. And if you don't know what OER is, I'll just I'll just read off uh, quickly a definition provided by Idaho State Board of Education. Uh, OER are materials like textbooks, courses, assignments, diagrams, and other teaching and learning resources that anyone may access and modify without cost thanks to their digital distribution and use of open licenses. Though these materials are distributed digitally, they may be printed or otherwise transformed for non-digital application thanks to the rights of users to copy, edit, remix, reuse, keep, and share. So that means that if, if people really want a more traditional textbook, that you can do print on demand in many cases. And uh, it's recognized that OER is, is but one means among other methods of making course materials both accessible and affordable. 
So I'll talk about OER for a second, and then I'll expand into some other maybe adjacently uh, related initiatives that we've been looking at at Boise State to, to try to influence um, uh, student cost or reduce, reduce student cost. Uh, and it really started a, a couple of years ago at Boise State. We've been talking about OER a little bit longer, but there were a couple of kind of serendipitous things that happened at once. Um, some members of our State Board of Education office had some tie-ins with folks at the Hewlett Foundation, uh, as well as Lumen Learning, if you're familiar with them. And so they started to uh, put together some workshops and talking sessions and stuff with these folks from Hewlett and, and Lumen. Uh, and meanwhile, at Boise State, kind of unrelated, but, but we ultimately uh, converged together. There was a grassroots group of people uh, from across campus that represented the library, IT, eCampus Center, instructional design units, uh, and later eventually the bookstore uh, joined in. We were starting to put together our own kind of informal events and workshops and brainstorming strategies to promote OER. So we got the state board level, the state level initiatives, and then things happening local at, locally at Boise State. And I think ever since those kind of culminating events of the uh, Hewlett and Lumen workshops, they have continued to grow and increase and gain momentum in parallel. And there's a good dialogue there between uh, what we're doing here at a campus level, and in many cases, playing a leadership role across the state and working with our board, board office to try to promote and promulgate some of these, these uh, ideas and practices. Um, quick shout out too to a member of my department, Jonathan Lashley. He manages what's called the I Open Group, which is a regional community of practice where we also discuss and, and promote uh, OER initiatives throughout Idaho and beyond. You know, we've got membership from Washington, Washington and Oregon as well. Um, so we've done a few things in the last couple of years. We've joined the Open Textbook Network, if you're familiar with that. It's a consortium of higher ed institutions. Um, they also have a library of OER content and resources. Membership gives us access to training and support, and it also helps them uh, potentially grow their catalog of resources. Uh, we promote the use of, of um, OER Commons as a repository to find content, and we have OER Commons integrated into our, our Blackboard Learning Management System. And we are in the midst of launching and exploring uses for an instance of Pressbooks, and this is more for uh, if a faculty member wants to publish their own content, then we have a platform that they can build, build and distribute that through. Um, I mentioned our bookstore, and it's nice. They've been really supportive in a lot of the OER initiatives that we've been working on. Um, our library also has some e-reserves e uh, for some titles that classes may use as a textbook, and they're actively communicating to faculty that may have where the library may own some titles that could serve as an alternative to, this, to the uh, quote unquote traditional textbooks that the students might purchase. Um, and our bookstore has this kind of neat interface for um, that, that included when you're selecting your, your book, there's a price slider that gives you an affordability score. The product is called Verba and the, the price slider and the purchasing form also opens a screen uh, here's just a, a quick screenshot example. I did a search for chemistry. It'll tell you uh, different texts and what their score is based on some criteria that they've set. And you can also search, if you see up here at the top, it says all or just within OER. So through the very mechanisms that faculty members are selecting and, and, um, and ordering their textbooks, they try to make it, you know, just really front of mind throughout that process that students can, um, or that faculty can opt to choose OER, more affordable alternatives for their students. And, and I think that that's, that's been moving the needle for us a little bit. Um, the bookstore, I should say, is it's an independent store. They've been really good that they, they don't, they make slim margin on textbooks and academic materials in general. So they're not super driven by profit. A lot of their revenue comes from um, the merchandise, clothing, things like that for, you know, for Boise State merch, uh, football kind of memorabilia, that kind of thing. So another kudos to uh, Michael in our bookstore, and we've been really, really good to work with. 
Uh, we did an inclusive access pilot with them, speaking of the bookstore. I don't know if you're familiar with, with inclusive access, but that's a kind of an industry term for uh, a model in which digital alternatives to textbooks are made available to all students uh, on day one. And it's built in either as a course fee or there's some other mechanism that says, we're gonna get 100% of your students in this course access to these digital materials and give them a significant reduction in, in price. Um, so we did a pilot with the bookstore. We've we've um, we recommended as a, as an IT unit that Vital Source had the biggest catalog. It was easiest to integrate into our LMS. Uh, but we also do recognize Red Shelf uh, as a former relationship. And I know that uh, Macmillan is getting more into this space and looking into mechanisms for every student to have access to these materials on day one. Um, students. Hey, Liz. Yes. Please, I'm sorry. I just wanted to interrupt you with um someone had made a has a question and kind of a comment about this. OER books are great, but our costs come in with the online homework programs. Any thoughts on that? Online homework programs. I, I, I agree with you. I don't have any really like solutions for that, but that is that's absolutely something that has been discussed uh, quite a bit, especially recently, is there are um, like fees or or like uh, uh, app codes where students need to go out to um, especially these like adaptive learning platforms or where they'll go and do practice practice exercises and things like that as part of the course. Um, in some cases, there are OER alternatives to those. I don't think they're quite as prominent as the OER alternatives to traditional textbooks. Uh, but that's another case where I think if you work with your publishers, if you talk about maybe um, negotiating or guaranteeing that a certain number of students would access those as part of an inclusive access program, um, then you then you could potentially see some reduction in in the uh, the fees associated with those things. Good question, though. I don't have a I don't have a good answer, but I'm I'm certainly aware of this as well. Uh, I need to, to just say some uh, really complimentary things about students at Boise State as well, because uh, here's a, the cover of our campus newspaper, a recent issue, where they are promoting OER. Um, and in fact, over the years, our students have been um, really good at promoting these kinds of projects. We were doing some student inter interviews related to an OER design project. We were thinking, how, you know, students, of course, they love OER. How do we get them to help us champion it kind of stuff? A couple surprises came out of those discussions, though. We learned that students, they don't necessarily care about cost as much as we think they do. Um, not to just totally upend the topic of this, of this presentation, um, but what they said to us is that they were willing to pay a reasonable fee for course materials as long as the content is quality, if they felt they were really learning from these, these materials, um, and that it was intentionally used in the class. I think that was the biggest problem that came from our student interviews, is they said, yeah, I'm paying for all these homework the websites and textbooks and all this kind of stuff, and it's never required. I never had to open a single page of this textbook that I paid $97 for. So here's where I think OER can be a catalyst, if nothing else, to think about uh, good course design or even course redesign, where you're being more thoughtful and selective about the content, materials, and activities that are going into your course. So that can help maybe indirectly address the question you raised about homework applications, but, but the problem of uh, intentional course design, I guess, really. Our student government has been really active in, in discussions about a lot of the things that we're working on. Uh, and the, the challenge with student government is that they graduate or they change roles uh, year to year. But I think something about the last few years at Boise State, they've been doing a really good job of passing the torch to that, that in, incoming generation of student senators. Um, so it's great. Their student senators are great to have on any committees that you might have as a campus. Uh, because they represent the student voice. That's part of their role. Um, and they're, they've been really um, uh, engaged, I think, on our campus. Let's shift gears a little bit, too, and talk about um, classrooms and a couple of the things that we're doing there to support student engagement. First, I'll narrowly define student engagement as it, um, 
pedagogical approaches, teaching and learning approaches to keeping students focused, participating, and essentially feeling like they're part of some in-class experience, right? Uh, clickers, obviously, the iClicker and ReFAPs are ways that facilitate active learning. Uh, in fact, the meta-analysis of acting, active learning strategies uh, a couple of years ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences mentioned clickers by name as an example of active learning and found that courses that used some active learning strategies throughout the course, they saw a significant increase in student performance. So just a, a quick citation, this is Freeman et al. 2014, if you want to go and look that up yourself, it's in uh, PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, good meta-analysis on active learning. So we not only promote the use of clickers as an example, we also talk about things like group work and um, uh, POGO, pro what is it? Project-oriented group-led inquiry is another model that we talk about. Um, but we also talk about the use of the iClicker or Reef app on your on a, on mobile devices um, as something that we really prioritize over the physical clickers. They have some good bundled options, uh, but we think that the app is really important to unlock some of the capabilities and new features that it affords us. Um, take advantage of the devices that students already have and use for so many things. Um, Boise State has been a leader in mobile learning initiatives for the past few years, so this just really aligns with, with some of our uh, values as an institution. And I'm really interested, whether it's physical clickers or, or the mobile apps, but I'm really interested in the potential to support uh, in-class engagement and participation, but also the aggregate data that we can harvest out of overall participation and attendance. So those are things that we're in discussions with as well and exploring how, how that, might, um, that might come to fruition. Um, on the topic of affordability, I mentioned uh, that CapEd is a local credit union for teachers and educators. We recently partnered with them to launch a new subscription-based model uh, where uh, members of the credit union can do a subscription model for either $425 or $550 a month. They can sign up for either six or nine credits, and this amounts to saving thousands of dollars as they do their uh, bachelor's degree completion in either a Bachelor of Applied Science or Multidisciplinary Studies majors. Uh, it's a fully online program and we're also uh, using this as a testing ground to, to do more uh, credit for prior learning kinds of things. I mentioned too that we really embrace the principles of design thinking. We try whenever possible to not just listen to students, but really include them in our processes. We bring together people from all across campus to try to have coordinated approaches to these very, very complicated problems. Um, and I mentioned clickers as an example uh, of active learning and a way to get students engaged. I didn't talk about the state of clickers before we adopted iClicker as our campus standard. Um, technically, we supported Turning Point for, for a few years. But in rea reality, what had happened is we had this hodgepodge of competing products and providers, especially in our high enrollment freshman classes. So this was a problem because many of these different products had fees associated with them. So now we've got freshman students, brand new to Boise State, we're trying to make a good first impression and they're buying three or four different devices and apps for one semester, their first semester at Boise State. So that was a problem. That was one of the things that we looked at as we did a, a evaluation of products. Because um, obviously the students were frustrated. So when we did a pilot, we were really intentionally targeting those freshman high enrollment courses um, to not just get the faculty all on board with using the same tool. I mean, obviously that was a part of our, our agenda, um, but also get lots of student feedback about their preferences. Um, so in these same courses, too, I should mention uh, around the same time, students were being charged a fee for an e-portfolio product that was well intended, but unfortunately being underused across these high enrollment freshman courses. And in many cases, it was just a reporting tool for administrators. It would be this last second, it's the end of the semester. Yeah, I guess you're supposed to submit some homework for the e-portfolio tools for our accreditation reports or whatever. We were charging students a fee for that. Um, so my team did an evaluation. We talked to students and faculty, and we suggested that folks use our 
LMS ePortfolio that was already included into Blackboard for free, and it, it had like 99% of what, what the other product did. And um, we suggested that, that we stop charging students this extra fee, this extra course fee for an ePortfolio tool that was used primarily for administrative functions. Um, so that was passed. We had a um, our associate vice provost of undergraduate studies was supportive and had this kind of like, well, duh moment, like, yeah, we shouldn't be charging students fees for this tool. Um, they supported that. Uh, we eliminated that. And I think the fret, the overall um, foundational courses, freshman experience is a lot better because now we have one student engagement tool. We don't charge them all these little ticky tacky fees for things. They don't have uh, new technologies to learn for all the different courses. And we're reducing that cognitive load or frustration that they might face while saving them money. Um, so I think that the, those are some good changes that we've made over time. So, so let's assume that we all care about students. Let's assume that we care not only about their individual, but also collective success uh, because it matters to them personally and it matters to us as an institution. To this last point, um, thinking about student engagement and inclusivity and success, I think there's a couple levels involved here and I'll, I'll try to talk through a couple of examples. So usually when we talk about students feeling connected or engaged, we think about um, efforts to try to make them feel welcome to uh, maybe attend events or sporting events. We want them to feel like they really belong on our campus, right? And we embrace the mantra that everyone is welcome and belongs and uh, that starts to manifest in a, in a lot of ways. And here's, here's just a quick, quick story. Uh, an employee at our campus rec center was checking in a, a non-traditional veteran student. Uh, we're also considered a military-friendly campus, by the way. We've got an Air Force base uh, just down the road here. And the student's ID card was giving the person who was checking him into the rec center an error. And there was some confusion about, you know, can they come in? Or they had to look into it a little bit. It took a few minutes. And uh, they had to man end up manually doing some paperwork and letting the student in. Student was really upset saying, man, this is like the third time this has happened to me in the last month and it's really frustrating. So this rec center employee, employee uh, luckily she happened to be a supervisor too. She took it upon herself and said, all right, I'm gonna look into this a little bit. Why, is, why does this guy keep getting an error? And it turned out that the GI Bill funds weren't dispersed and entered into our uh, student information system until a few weeks because of just the timing of when that was processed and stuff like that. So that had this downstream effect where it showed up as an error at the rec center check-in kiosk. And uh, the student said, all right, I'm gonna dig into this further. Can I, change, can I change the process? Can I change when the GI bill is processed? Unfortunately, she couldn't. That was beyond, beyond her scope, above her pay grade, however you wanna say it. Uh, but she still didn't give up. And she said, you know what? I'm gonna have a team meeting with all the people who work the front desk at the rec center. And I'm gonna say, we need to change our practices. Here's this thing that I know about the GI Bill. And she told all of the people to check in students at the front desk. She said, if, any, if you come across anybody that's trying to come in and they're military or veteran and you see this kind of flag come up, here's what's going on. So I want you to be, show them respect, explain to them what happened, thank them for their service, whatever you need to do to make it as pleasant an experience as possible. Um, and so, I think it's so critical with our new transfer and returning students that everybody embrace this attitude that the university isn't just about transactions and well, and that's the rule, so this is the way it is, but really look for opportunities to, um, to make it just a better, a better experience for all our students, right? So that's one level of engagement, making people feel welcome, trying to reduce some of the, the discomfort of the processes that we just have to live with on a day-to-day -day -day basis. And this other level is one that I think is kind of obvious, but it's also important for me to try to articulate. And it's something I've seen a lot with student employees that they don't just wanna feel welcome, they wanna feel useful. They wanna feel like they have some kind of responsibility in this campus community and that others depend on them. I've seen it in the student employees and mentors in departments like our multicultural student services where they want to give back to other students like them uh, who maybe felt kind of isolated or like not engaged and stuff. They really want, 
they have this feeling of obligation to reach out to them and give them the same kind of support and opportunities that they have. I've seen it in students working on service learning or design or other projects in our business or communication departments. I've seen it in the student testimonials where they have, there's like this turn in their thinking where they feel like going to class is like transactional. They just want to get a good grade. They're motivated by these extrinsic kind of things. And then suddenly they join a club or a sorority or they're working on a project and they're like, you know what? I really owe these other classmates of mine something of myself. And so I have this sense of responsibility to participate and it becomes less about transactional and individual and more about a community kind of experience. So I think there's a, a kind of subtle and, and an important difference between saying things like, yes, everybody's welcome, as opposed to saying, we need each of you to contribute to this experience. You have a purpose here, you have a voice, people depend on you, and you're a vital part of this shared evolving experiment we call higher education. Sylvia Gray in 2013 talks about uh, at-risk students. She was at uh, the University of Eastern Michigan and working on one of these pilot programs to try to help students that, that were at risk with uh, you know, retention and things like that. Um, so she had, she taught a class with uh, a high number of, of these students that were low performing, Pell eligible, um, things like that. And she said, she said to them, welcome to college. This will change you forever. And you are the change the world has been waiting for. You are expected to be successful and then go back to your community to serve. And she said that every class period, she kept reinforcing this message that you're expected to be successful and you're expected to go back to your community to serve. And what she found out was that 88% uh, of her students at the end of the day, I mean, and if you read the article, it's much more about just you know student performance and stuff, but the result of this kind of mantra was that they ended up being successful. 88% of her students passed with an A or a B, only one student failed. And this is the really neat part of, about the article is that, is that Gray, um, she describes in full detail what was going on with the student. She said the student didn't successfully complete the course uh, because she drove to the university from her home in Flint, Michigan. She worked at a fast food restaurant every day until midnight. And many days she was unable to drive to campus because she didn't have gas or there was a problem with her car. She eventually became so frustrated that she stopped coming to class that she missed the deadline to withdraw. So I think we need to think about the individual experiences that our students have and try to be empathetic as, as possible because when we talk about student success and retention and affordability, it's really, really complex. There are no easy answers. It's a social, economical, psychological structure, structural, there's all kinds of different factors at play. Uh, and some of them are within our control, right? And those are the ones that we really need to focus on, but they require good intentional collaboration. They require a variety of coordinated strategies. Some of them I touched on here, but there's a lot more going on here at Boise State and all over the place. Um, but perhaps the simplest thing we can do as members of our institution is, is agree uh, and really instill the value that we care about our students, we listen to them, we involve them, we expect them to contribute, and we expect them to succeed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leif. I really um, enjoy hearing the examples that you give and just some of the really cool things that you're doing at, at Boise State to uh, to help students be successful and um, and in particular just take like you said kind of taking away some of the barriers or reducing costs and and um, it's clear that you guys are very student centric there and I, I think that's wonderful thank you for for sharing those um, we can stay on for a couple minutes I don't see any questions coming through but you know I want to give you guys a chance to type something in if you have any comments or questions you want to make I don't want to uh, miss any of that so um, I'm happy to hang on here for another minute or if, if you need to hop off that's fine too um, thank you again for your time and uh, Leif I want to thank you too if you could uh, if, if you have just a couple minutes just in case we do get some questions I, I'd love it if you can stay on for another minute or two we're getting just some nice uh, thank yous <laughs> Thank you. 
Hey, Liz, one, one thing that you had showed, I'm not sure if we caught the name of, it was on the bookstore website where they gauge the affordability. Um, was that Verba or? Verba Connect is the name of the product, and they're, they were fairly recently acquired by Vital Source. The, um, the, what's the name of the platform? E text platform I mentioned. Gotcha. Oh, someone wrote something really nice. They had only considered OER for affordability, and you gave other ideas as well, which is great. So glad you were able to get more from that. Yeah, I think OER is great because, like I mentioned, it's an opportunity to redesign your course and your curriculum. I also think there's some potential, and this is not really explored a ton in the literature that I've seen, but I think there's potential in um, having students contribute to the OER community. So you could have student projects where, where they might be creating some sort of a learning resource or, or a chapter or some, some kind of artifact around a topic that gives them an opportunity to learn about it, but then also give back to the OER um, broader community of resources. Great, thanks. One other question, and this is more uh, transactional for me. Someone had asked about certificates, and we don't really send a certificate, but we do send as part of our follow-up email that acknowledges that you did participate. Um, if you need more than that, you're welcome to contact me directly, and I, I'm happy to put something together for you, but hopefully that follow-up email is um, is okay. But if I'm going to put my uh, email address in the chat area, and if you need to reach me um, for something more formal, just let me know. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions, so um, I will just uh, take one last opportunity to thank all of you who joined us, and, and Lee, also just want to thank you so very much. Um, really uh, appreciate your, your great thoughts and willingness to share them, and keep up the great work at Boise State. And with that, I will uh, close out the webinar. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Rhonda. Take care. Bye-bye.